Hi everyone, welcome to a video here that's going to discuss the steady state approximation. So this, uh, to this point in uh, kinetics and our consideration of react is we have looked at um, the process of looking at reaction mechanisms that have a known slow step. So we know that the first or second or third step, whatever it might be within the series of elementary steps, is the rate determining or slow step. Well, what do we do in the case in that we have a, uh, a known slow step? What do we do in that case? Well, we're going to use something called the steady state approximation. So this is a different approach. It's actually a more general approach to uh, understanding, to vetting, to interpreting reaction mechanisms. So we don't know, we don't have good evidence to suggest that one step is slow, but we still want to be able to evaluate the mechanism. The steady state approximation is going to allow us to do that. Now, at the end of the day, what does the steady state approximation do? It's actually a fairly straightforward concept. What it does is it considers the concentration of any reaction intermediate or intermediates, um, all, all reaction intermediates, the materials that grow in at some point during the reaction mechanism and then go away, so they're not a reactant or they're not a product, they're an intermediate, that the concentration of the intermediate is held constant during the large portion of the mechanism. So obviously intermediates need to grow in concentration initially and at the end of the reaction their concentration goes away. But for a large portion of the mechanism we're going to consider the intermediate concentration to be equal. Now in order for that to happen that must mean that the rate at which the intermediate is being produced is going to be equal to the rate at which the intermediate is getting consumed. So for this mathematical statement here to be true, its production and consumption rates must be equal. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this uh, process, and we're going to look at um, kind of a, a sample example here that's going to be very general. I have here a reaction mechanism. Uh, reactant A plus B goes to form intermediate C, which then goes on to form product P. Now we'll use our usual notation, namely that the, uh, the first step here is going to be comprised of rate constants that we can identify as K1 and K-1 for the reverse of the first step, and that the rate constant for the second step can be identified as K sub 2. Okay. So, let's go ahead and set this up. Now, since we don't have a rate determining step, I haven't articulated that K1, K-1, K-2, I haven't said that any of these are particularly small, so we don't have a slow step here. But we still need to start somewhere. We need to start our problem solving algorithm someplace. So, we're going to use a little bit of common sense. What do we care about in chemistry? We care about making stuff. So what I'm going to really care about is the rate at which I form my product. So, what is my product forming step? It's the second step of the reaction mechanism. So what's the rate law for that second step? Well, it would simply be dp dt is going to be equal to k sub 2 times the concentration of C. That's how I make the product P. I go from C to P. So there's my rate law for the product forming step. So I've started somewhere. Now I don't know what the concentration of C is because that's an intermediate and I don't know the value of K2 but at least I've started somewhere. And the, the place we've started here is we've introduced the concentration of C. In other words, we are needing to know about the concentration of our intermediate. So this is the whole thing about the steady state approximation. We said at the out set here that the steady state approximation states that the change in concentration of any intermediate is going to be equal to zero. Well, for the mechanism up here, for that statement to be true, we have to have the following mathematical statement. DC DT is going to be equal to the rates of those reactions that make the intermediate C minus the rates of those reactions that consume or get rid of the intermediate C. So how do we make the intermediate C? Well we make C in this first step right here K1 times A times B. So I'm looking at the forward portion 
of the first step. K1 is the rate constant for the forward part of the first step, and then I have the concentrations of A and B. Now remember, I can write down the rate law for elementary steps directly from the molecularity of the elementary steps. So I know that this is first order in A and first order in B, because that's what's actually going on. All right, so that's the only thing that makes C. No other step produces C. Everything else gets rid of C. So now I have to look at those steps that get rid of C. So let's see if I can do this in a different color here. I'll pick red. So now I get rid of C by doing the reverse of the first step. That's this K negative 1 C term. And I also get rid of C by going from C to product. That's the K2 C term there. Notice that I have minus signs in front of those rate laws because they are getting rid of C. So I'm going to go back to uh, my blue color here. So I make C in the first step, and then I get rid of C in the reverse of the first and the second step. And then all of that stuff has to add up to zero. So my DC, DT term has to equal zero. Okay? Great. Now let's keep moving with this algorithm. Now I have my steady state approximation for my intermediate. Now I'm going to solve that steady state approximation for the unknown concentration, namely the concentration of the intermediate. So my steady state approximation, my SSA, DCDT, was equal to K1AB minus K-1C minus K2C. That all equals zero. So I'm just going to algebraically solve the math here for the concentration of C. And the concentration of C is K1AB divided by K minus 1 plus K2. So that's my concentration of my intermediate. Now, remember, where did we start? We started by looking at how fast I'm going to form product P, my DP, DT statement. And that was equal to K2 times the concentration of the intermediate C. Now, I know my value for my concentration of C. It's that statement there, which I can plug right into the concentration of C. So, my fourth and sort of final step here in doing the steady state approximation to go ahead and substitute the concentration of the intermediate that I just solved for by way of the steady state approximation into the rate law for the product forming step, K2 times C. And so, that's what I get here. I get dpdt is equal to little k2 times the concentration of C. Right? All of this stuff here is the concentration of C. So that's what I plug in. So little k1 ab divided by k negative 1 plus k2. What have I accomplished here? I have written a rate law for the formation of my product P now in terms of those things that I can control, namely the concentration of A and the concentration of B. That's what we need rate laws to be done with respect to. They need to be written in terms of concentration of reactants, and of course we can vary the temperature and that will um, uh, change the values of K. But now you're looking at this and you're probably thinking, whoa, Dr. Crane, I've got way more Ks than I'm used to looking at. But that's okay no pun intended, that's okay because we can take all of these k's and I can wrap them up because they're all constants. If you take constants and you multiply them by other constants, what do you get? You get new constants. Take a constant, divide it by other constants. What do you get? A new constant. So all that stuff that I've just drawn in the sort of kidney-shaped red circle there is just another constant that I'm going to call some overall constant k. So I have my product formation rate law, dp, dt, written in terms of concentration of reactants and a rate constant, k. So I now have a rate law for a mechanism that did not have a rate determining step. I've done something pretty, pretty helpful here. So here's what I've done. I've taken this mechanism... A plus B makes the intermediate C, goes to form the product P. I have no identifiable rate determining step, but I was still able to write, albeit a messy one, I was able to write a 
um, a, a differential rate law, something in terms of concentration of reactants, and K, or in this case, lots of Ks. Now what we're going to talk about in class, we're going to go into this in a little bit more detail, but if I look at the collection of rate constants here in more detail, and I start to impose some limitations on the system. For example, what if I were to say that the first step, let's say that the first step actually is a rate determining step. I've done some other uh, experiments and I'm drawn to the conclusion that the first step might actually be a rate determining step. Well, what happens to all the gobbledygook here in my red kidney shape if the first step is rate determining? What would that change about what you see there in the red shape. On the other hand, what if I were to say that the second step is rate determining? What if the, the C to P process is rate determining? What would that do to all the stuff that's in the kidney shape there? That's what we'll talk about in more detail in class, but now You've seen the steady state approximation. You've been introduced to it. Uh, we're also going to put up on the Moodle page um, a PDF document from a different textbook that leads you through the steady state approximation analysis for a slightly different situation. And so you'll have um, some additional background. So you've watched this video. Also take some time to read that short, uh, I think it's two-page PDF document um, on the steady state approximation that we'll put up on Moodle. All right, we'll see you in class.